Uh, thanks for being here tonight, guys. I hope we're going to have a good ride together. I uh, want to talk about generative AI, generative tech as we call it. Okay. And uh, so let me walk through how we see it. So it feels to me like we are beginning what we're calling the transition. The transition is essentially where we're moving from carbon-based life to silicon-based life. And we're all privileged to be on this planet when this is happening. Some of you uh, might be old enough to have been privileged to be here when the sort of connecting took place, starting in 1994. And we've now entered the transition because so much of what we as people think of human is going to be increasingly located and enabled by our software and our silicon and perhaps even our DNA experiments over the next 40 or 50 years. It's a big deal, and we're here to see it. Steve Jobs famously said that the computer was a bicycle for the mind. Well, this is a mind, guys. It's not a very smart mind yet, but it can certainly take a Wharton class, as we've seen. Have you seen that article where the AI took the Wharton class and got an A or a B or something? So this is a mind. And it's not just one mind, it's many minds. It's not just one bicycle helping one human, it's many minds helping each human. It's a big transition, all right? So if you can increase someone's output by 30%, we call that progress. But if you can increase somebody's output by 20x, that's a revolution. And we've now entered that, OK? Now, the other thing that's happening is that the internet, as we know it, the topology is changing. In the old days, we had our stored databases, our relational databases in the center of the cloud. And we would just take our computers and look at it. Now we're going to be able to generate new data on the edges of the cloud and then send it back in if we want or keep it on the edges if we want. And that just changes a lot of the way the applications are going to work going forward. So what that means for you as founders is that there's now an opening. There's a wedge that you can now jump in and start doing things with different topologies that were never done before. And you're going to be looking at 20x productivity improvements to juice the interests of your customers or your users. Right? We haven't had something like this happen since 2008 when we got the smartphone. Traditionally, this happens about every 14 years if you go back looking at the browser in 94. 2008, the mobile, and now we've got the generative AI, okay? So this is that moment. Now I can tell you, as a founder who started four companies, and now I've been investing in hundreds of companies over the last decade, last decade has been pretty damn boring. <laughs> it's been the same old thing over and over again. Once we got DoorDash and you know, a couple things in 2013, everything kind of went quiet from a seed perspective, from a startup perspective. It was the same old stuff. And I can tell you, sitting there, we review 8,000 companies a year. And most of the ideas are crap, like 7,900 of them. Because it's the same stuff over and over again. And we've got a map of over 500 companies in the generative AI space, and most of them are all the same thing. Again, people aren't thinking inventively, because for the last 14 years, we've all been lulled. We're all numb. We've got to start thinking bigger again because we have that moment. But that moment's going to last for 24 months. Typically, it lasts for 24, 30 months. That's about it. And it closes up. All right? That's the moment you're in right now. And so you should be paying attention. All right, now, what's it going to affect? It's going to affect everything. Anything you're interested in, anything you're working on, is going to be impacted by generative tech and generative AI. And it's not just that you're going to be able to take what you're doing and get some productivity gains. It's that the things that are being done are going to change radically. And if you think big enough and you see how this can happen, you're going to be able to really drive into that wedge and create some great things. All right, now's that moment. One thing I want to point out to you that most people are missing in terms of how they're thinking about this, perhaps because of the name generative tech or generative AI, is that in fact, what's really amazing about this stuff is that it reads well. It reads, it summarizes, it simplifies, it ranks, it grades, it comments on things. 
And most people are just focusing on what they can make, because they can make those cool pictures of you being a troll king or an elven queen or whatever we can do with this stuff. And that's great, but really what's amazing about it is, is that it reads. Now, what I'll tell you is that what is my job? What do I do all day long? I read. I summarize. I simplify. I rank. I collate. My job is going to change more in the next 10 or 15 years than most other jobs. Investment banking, lawyers, these are the jobs that are going to really change over the next 10, 15 years. Doctors, teachers, people who work at manufacturing facilities, those jobs will look pretty much the same 15 years from now is my prediction. But what all you big brains do is going to change a lot. And everyone's complaining that all oh, the students can use that GPT chat thing to to you know, write their essays. I'm like, yeah, but the teachers can use it to grade the essays. And if you've asked it to grade one of your essays, you will see that you get better comments from ChatGPT than you do from your professors. <laughs> because they're working six days a week. They are way overworked. They can't give you the feedback they want to give you. They're doing their job because they want to give you the feedback. But they don't have time. But these things do. It's going to accelerate your learning. It's going to really change your job. OK? Here's a way to think about it. There's five layers in this generative stack. At the bottom is everything everybody's talking about, open AI, right? Then you're going to have specific AI models, things that just write tweets better, things that just do e-commerce photos better, all right? But the general models might end up supplanting those, or you're going to end up with hyperlocal AI models, which will look just at your Nike photos in your database because you work at Nike, and it's going to just make those photos look just like Nike consistently with the brand. And your AI model will train on your proprietary data and a closed loop system. And whoever manages that AI for them will have a pretty good, more defensible business because they can't just be replaced because they have unique data sets. That's the third layer, the hyperlocal models. Or if you have a, a magazine and you have a certain style of writing, you know, you train it on their 12 writers and how they write, and then the, the AI will help your writers write in that style right from the get go. Okay, you're going to see a lot of these hyperlocal models for everything going forward. Above that, you've got your operating system, your API layer. That's where the network effects are. Okay? We're called NFX, stands for network effects, because we believe that the biggest companies come from network effects. That layer, that platform layer, that's where the network effects are. And then on top of that, you're going to have these applications. You're going to have these killer apps. Like in 2004, there was a college photo sharing killer app that became a big platform. First called Facebook, then called Meta, and who knows what it's going to become. It's a good starting point to find a killer app. And these killer apps are out there trying to discover who they are, like a Jasper. And if they can get the right to install in an application layer, like an OS, or an API, then that's probably a, a potentially a good model. Okay? But be aware, in the, last, in the last big change in 2008, with the mobile phones, who got most of the billions? The incumbents. Apple and Google. They got the Android and they got the iOS. They got most of the billions. And there was some door dashing and some Ubering and whatnot to feed the hungry mouths of all the venture capitalists and feed the hungry mouths of all the founders. And they left us some crumbs, but they got the most of it. The same thing's going to happen here, except it's not going to be Apple this time. It's going to be Microsoft, because they have the distribution. It'll be Google and Microsoft are going to get the majority of the value created by this transformation. But there's still going to be many decacorns built, still many unicorns built in this wedge, in sectors that those guys won't want to pay attention to or be too small for them. But for you, a 40 or a $60 billion company would be just fine. <laughs> so obviously, the consumers and the workers are all going to win because we're all going to be able to do much more. Everyone's going to get access to it like water. Incumbents like Google and Microsoft are going to get most of it. Incumbents with distribution already are going to implement this and add this. right? So NFX will add it. Sequoia will add it. Right? And then the startups, that's the open wedge. That's what's left for you guys, and that's what's left for us to invest in. All right. Again, we've got this big map that you should go check out because it'll convince you that the great idea you have, everybody else has it too. And I know you've built a prototype, and I know you've already sold $10,000 of it, maybe $50,000 of it. I've heard that story 60 times in the last two months. 
The problem is everyone has the same idea. Everyone's got 50,000, 100,000 of revenue per month. I get it. But the idea needs to be unique at this point. This map will show you that there's already plenty of people doing your idea. So you need to think harder. Take the next step. What's it look like next? So there's going to be three phases of this. One is what we're seeing mostly. Most of that map is this phase, which is putting a wrapper around the AI. We'll see what happens. The second thing is that people are going to be using generative AI to do some business which has nothing to do with AI, like renovate apartment buildings. We will give you a renovated apartment building faster and cheaper than any place else. Great, I'm in. I didn't have to say anything about AI. I'm not selling the AI. I'm using the AI to make it faster and cheaper, more accurate. But I'm not selling the AI to you. You're not buying AI. You're buying, renovating your apartment building in a marketplace. Okay. And then it's going to be the stuff, the visionary stuff, the stuff that we can't imagine. Right? When you first saw the smartphone, you didn't think, oh, man, that's really going to change taxi industry. It didn't occur to you. Right? We didn't get sidecar for about 18 months. We didn't get Lyft for another, another six months after that, and Uber came a month after that. So it took about two years before some of the more revolutionary stuff started happening around the last platform shift. Those things are really exciting, and I encourage you all to push forward with your thinking about how everything changes. Everything changes. We are running a, a program inside our company, and I encourage you to run it with all of your friends. What can be improved and how you do your work as a student and how any, anybody you're talking to, how can AI play into it? It's simple, but it's actually very few people are actually spending the hours to do it right now. Everyone's a little scared. I encourage you to get over that fear and just do it. Okay? Uh, here's the problem. When the internet first came out in 94, a lot of people thought it was stupid. Bob Metcalf, very famous guy, said it was like CB radio and it was just a fad. What that did was it allowed the 4,000 people who believed in the internet to have an open space to build companies without too much competition. Okay? Uh, when crypto came out, I mean, still everyone's skeptical, right? How many people have Bitcoin? It's like 120 million people out of 4 billion people on the internet. It's still a lot of skepticism about it. We can understand why. But there's a lot of skepticism, which means that if you get into it and believe in it, you can make hay. That's not the case here. What's happening here is a little bit more like when Facebook opened up their platform in 2008. Hundreds of thousands of people started building apps. It was a gold rush. Same thing's happening here. So you have to move fast. There's no skeptics. Everybody gets it. Everybody gets it. So in order to win in this, you're going to have to have speed. You're going to have to move fast and be aggressive more so than other sectors that we've seen in the last 20 years, except for that Facebook platform thing, which was just literally hour by hour, day by day. Whoever got ahead, it was hourly. Guys, I can tell you stories. I won't today, but it was literally hourly. It's who would get ahead, and then their network effect, their viral growth would experience. So uh, that's coming. That's, that's happening in this sector.